Hello, I'm Kathy Moore and this is Steps in a Journey. Steps in a Journey is a class on the spiritual life, how to live in the spirit. And, and it's also uh, a journey, uh, a quest to, to find out what God is calling each one of us to do in our life. Because he has a special plan for each one of us. And I know if you ask God, what do you want me to do? He'll say the same answer to each one of us. Love me. Just love me. When Sister Mary Matthew was before a statue, I mean a, a castle of a saint in... Um, uh, I, I don't remember what saint it was, but uh, she was in the chapel where the saint would go and pray in the, in the castle. And she prayed to the saint, tell me, tell me some, some uh, guidance. And, the, and she got into her mind as if the saint was speaking right to her, only love matters. And when we gave our talk on, on offering it up, the Lord speaking to St. Ca Catherine of Siena, and he said, it's not necessarily offering up your suffering and your pain to me, but offer up your love to me, and your life to me. That's what counts, is your love for me. And, and not necessarily having pain to offer up. And this is what Steps in a Journey is, is all about, is, is growing closer together to our Lord Almighty God and developing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We've been talking on the gift uh, on prayer. We've offered a whole course on prayer. And now we're talking, um, part of it, is the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that guides us to prayer, that encourages us to prayer. That it, it's only through the Holy Spirit that we can even say, Abba, Father. And so the Holy Spirit is very, very important. And we are given gifts of the Holy Spirit with our baptism. With our baptism, we're, uh, we have the... Uh, theological gifts of faith, hope, and charity, as well as the other gifts of uh, pay, uh, prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. And, and we were also given the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we've been talking about lately. We've gone over the gifts of, of um, fear, of fortitude, piety, and counsel in our last talk. And this one, we're going to be talking about knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. The seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, the gifts of fear, fortitude, piety, and counsel. The Holy Spirit regulates our moral life. Whereas by the other gifts, understanding, knowledge, and wisdom, he governs our theological life. That is, our relationship with God. The first four gifts perfect the moral virtues, especially, especially. And the last three perfect the theological gifts of faith, hope, and charity. They are the so-called gifts of the contemplative life, the life of prayer and union with God. It's, it's not easy to live in the realm of the sense, to believe that God is all, that, that he's the only good, the only happiness, and to place all of our hope on him alone because he's veiled from sight we can't see him 
And so we find it difficult to believe that creatures are nothing. To be convinced of their vanity. Well, they present themselves so alluringly. Therefore, we need more powerful help. A divine light which illumines from within. Without the need of passing through reasoning and which is our reasoning is so limited and also rude. It is this light of the Holy Spirit infuses into our soul by means of the gift of knowledge. This gift does not make us reason on the vanity of things, but it gives us a living concrete experience of the vanity of them. An intuition so clear that it admits no doubt. Under the influence of this gift, Francis of Assisi suddenly left his merry companions to espouse Lady Poverty. Under the impulse, in, impulse of this gift, Teresa of Avila wrote, All things pass. God never changes. He who has God lacks nothing. God alone suffices. Inspired by the gift of knowledge, St. John of the Cross wrote, Nothing, nothing, neither this nor that, neither the goods of the earth nor the goods of heaven, that is, not even the joys and consolations, but God alone. In the measure that the gift of knowledge develops in the soul, it understands and tastes the nothingness of creatures, which makes it relish the all of God and feel the need of escaping from creatures to plunge into Him. This is the first step toward contemplation. God is the only reality and it is He who gives value to all things either because they are the works of His hands or because they are works done for His glory. And the Holy Spirit reminds us of the words of Jesus what shall profit it a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his soul? That's from Mark chapter 8, 36. When a soul is enlightened by the gift of knowledge, creatures no longer hinder his ascent to God. For whether considering their nothingness or their beauty with which God has endowed them, whether considering giving them up or using them through necessity, they always urge the soul to God, inspiring the soul to, to seek Him and to love Him. The one infinite, the one infinite beautiful thing is God. To love Him above all things. It goes along with the beatitude of blessed are they that mourn. For they shall be comforted. Matthew 5, verse 5. 
This corresponds, this beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, corresponds to the gift of knowledge. Blessed are they who, thoroughly enlightened by the Holy Spirit, as to the nothingness of creatures, weep for the time spent seeking the creatures. And they mourn over their energy and affection that they have wasted on the vanities of the world. Saint Augustine lamented, Late have I loved thee, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved thee. Thou wert with me, but I was not with thee. Creatures kept me from thee. These are the tears of the, of the penitent Magdalene who wept and washed her hair, used her hair to wash the feet of Jesus. St. Peter weeping after his fall. Blessed tears, cleansing tears from sin and disposing them for friendship with God. The gift of knowledge make, makes us clearly realize the vanity of creatures and convinces us that they are perishable and full of defects. Hence, it incites us to place all our hope in God. In this sense, the gift of knowledge perfects and strengthens the virtue of hope. So that without further hesitation, our heart anchors itself in God, recognizing in Him our only strength and support, our only happiness. Under the influence of the gift of knowledge, the soul understands the blessedness of tears, that is, the blessedness of suffering embraced by the love of God. This, this gift does not this gift does not make us insensible to pain and suffering, but more resigned to God's will. It sanctifies our weeping and makes us surrender to God's will. What a difference between these tears and those shed through pride because we will not submit to God's will. So unhappy are those who are suffering and they will not accept their suffering and they just complain completely all day long to those around them. And those that accept their suffering for the love of God and how, what a difference it makes to those who are caregivers. When a soul has reached the point where it prefers blessed tears shed at the foot of the cross to the joys of earth, it can hope in the beatitude promised by Jesus, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Many of us in the secular society do not give up everything. But many of the religious, both men and women, take the vow of poverty and give up all their material possessions. And they cannot do this without this gift of understanding that material things are not all that they are make out to be. Sister would often say, give things up, just little things, especially, she would often say this during Lent, but she also said it all year long. She says, if you just like coffee with your cream and sugar, just drink it black. Don't tell anybody. 
just drink it black and say, Lord, I'm making this little sacrifice for you. Sister loved red. She entered the convent wearing a, a red dress and a red hat and red shoes. And it went very striking with her jet black hair. And I remember, because I, I took pictures of her in her habit. She always had a different blouse on with her habit. She could wear a different blouse. And she often wore a red turtleneck or a red blouse. I remember the collar sticking out. And then gradually she would start saying, I'll wear red in heaven. I didn't notice that she didn't wear red anymore on earth until she died and we went through her clothes and there was not one red blouse or turtleneck hanging in her closet. She had quietly given them all to Ark who went to Value Village. I am not is I have not taken the vow of poverty but I still had to give up many, many things in my household to come and join Sister. I came with her in my little blue escort, and everything that the escort contained, that's how much I had when I joined Sister. Yes, I acquired quite a few things after she died, and, and I have a storage house now. But uh, I have also many ministries in which that storage is very uh, useful for. Because, uh, you know, when you just live in a bedroom, you just don't have enough room for the, uh, you know, CD cases, DVD cases, because I make many CDs, DVDs, camping gear. I still go camping, or at least I hope to. Uh, uh, so there's lots of things that I still haven't given up that I've acquired since I've joined Sister. The next gift of the Holy Spirit after knowledge is the gift of understanding. As we advance toward God, we encounter many difficulties, not only of creatures obstructing our path, but also because of the impenetrability of the divine mysteries, things we don't understand, and that's a, a obstacle to us. And to able to surmount the gift, uh, the, the obstacle of creatures, we're given the un gift of knowledge, and to penetrate the divine mysteries we're given the gift of understanding. Our intellect is just incapable of, of seizing the infinite. How do you know there's a God when you can't see him? How do we know what he's like? Our mind just cannot grasp it. Although gifted with faith, its manner and understanding is always human, proceeding by means of ideas and limited concepts, which are totally inadequate to express the divine realities. Revelation itself comes to us in human language, written down in the scripture in the Bible. Therefore, it, it cannot tell us what God is in himself, nor manifest to us the intimate essence of revealed truth. Proceeding with the virtue of faith alone, we are constrained to stop, so to speak, at the at the surface of the divine mysteries. We know with certitude that, that they have been revealed by God and 
we adhere to them with all of our strength and yet we don't succeed in penetrating them. However, what faith cannot do, it is able to do with a gift of understanding. This gift surpasses our human way of comprehension and it enlightens us to the divine way. It is a swift, deep penetration which, while adding nothing new to what we already knew from Revelation, does make us understand the inner meaning of revealed truth. Faith tells us that God is Trinity, but the gift of understanding actually tells us nothing more. It does not make us see, nor does it explain the mystery to us, but it makes us penetrate it. Under the influence of this gift, the soul not only believes that God is one and three, but it has the intuition that the mystery of the Trinity is essential to the divine nature and that it reveals better than anything else the perfection, the power, and the infinite love of God. Only the Holy Spirit, who is God, can make us penetrate the divine mysteries. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, to us what God has revealed by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So the things also that are of God, no man knoweth but the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit that is of God, that we may know the things that have been given to us by God. As from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. And this is the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit that He performs in us by the gift of understanding. He communicates a share of knowledge of the divine in, in, mysteries to souls united by Him by love. Love, love. There was that word. What do you what do you want me to do, Lord? What is it you want me to do? Love me. Simply love me. And it's through love that the Holy Spirit gives us all these gifts. The gifts of understanding so that we understand the mysteries of God. Not understanding and so that we can explain it to others. But just understanding that when we hear people who are so against God, we just shake our heads. And yet we, we often not given the words to explain our own faith. The beatitude that goes with the gift of understanding is the clean, blessed are the clean of heart. Blessed are the key, clean of heart, for they shall see God. Matthew 5, verse 8. There is a purity of heart which is the indispensable condition for receiving an Im abundant inflowing of the Holy Spirit, the clean of heart. You need that for this gift of the Holy Spirit to penetrate you or to you to penetrate the gift. It is the purity of heart that results not only from the absence of sin but also 
from the absence of any slight earthly affection is the pure of heart. The absence of sin and the absence of earthly affection. In fact, God does not communicate himself fully to a creature whose heart is not absolutely pure. That is, one whose entire capacity for affection is not reserved for God. As long as we have an attachment to creatures, an attachment to sin, any or uh, attachment to seeking the affection of others, any complacency in feeling that we are loved by them. Our heart is not pure enough to enjoy the divine communications. God subjects a soul to a purification of the affections by means of detachments and sacrifices. And that's why it's so important to be detached and offer up your sacrifices during Lent and all year long. Little sacrifices. Lord, I, I'm, I'm offering this up to you to become pure of heart, to learn to be detached from the creature things of the earth. Sometimes we offer all up things up and the price is our blood. But which, if generously accepted, will eventually detach the heart from creatures and leave it entirely free for its creator. And this is what the martyrs had. Total detachment of the world and total attachment to God, their love. If God makes us pass through this trial, let us not try to draw back and evade its action, but let us cooperate with it, fully persuaded that he, he reserves the fullness of his gifts and of his light to those souls alone who are free from any shadow of creatures whose hearts belong entirely to him. There is another purity of heart, which is not just a disposition to receive the gift of understanding, but it is the, the fruit of this gift. And this is, the, this is the word heart is the broader understanding of spirit and mind, which is the usual meaning given in Scripture when it talks about giving your heart to the Lord giving your spirit and your mind to God. Our minds are, are so dull that we can always err in understanding divine things, either by imagining them in a material way or measuring them by worldly standards or by interpreting them according to personal views, considering only one aspect of the divine things and ignoring others that are essential. The dullness of mine, unfortunately, has been the source of many heresies in the church. And the gift of understanding gives us the light of the Holy Spirit itself, himself, and it purifies our minds from these errors and frees them from the illusions of the imagination as as well as from other false interpretations. I remember when I was baptized in the Spirit, it was my like my mind would say when someone was speaking, what that person is saying is the truth. What that person just said is the false. And what that person said is their own opinion. And 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 this gift comes forward in many ways when you read books like Harry Potter my mind just went and said that statement is false and that's going to lead children astray and that statement is totally uh, fabricated 
or even listening to some of the debates going on in this election year. It just says, it just rings a bell. Wow, that person is way off. You can just spot it. And it is this gift of understanding that allows you, your mind, to grasp such things. This gift which allows us to penetrate the divine mysteries by the infused light of the Holy Spirit makes us clearly understand that God cannot be enclosed by our dull imaginations nor in our limited ideas, but that he is infinitely superior to anything we can think or imagine about God. And God never changes. And if we wish to respond to the motions of the gift of understanding, we must be detached from our own ideas and re ready to renounce them, even though they're very dear to us. We must not be too sure about our way of understanding of the things of God but must seek the guidance of the church. And above all, we must humbly pray for the gift of understanding because it will free us from errors and give us the right understanding of divine things. Infused light of understanding by the Holy Spirit and they said the same thing about infused light of knowledge of the Holy Spirit. It's infused. It just comes into you. And uh, this happened to me in, when I lived in California. We had a prayer group. Uh, we met after church on Wednesday. There was about 12 or 13 of us that met. And Father met with us, and we were, it was a Bible study group. And when the Catechism of the Catholic Church came out, we asked Father, can we study the Catechism? And so we did for two, the two hours after Mass, and, and uh, went paragraph by paragraph deep into uh, discussing and talking about what was in the Catechism. One day, one Wednesday, Father couldn't be there. I think he had a, a sick call and he had to go away. And so he wasn't there. And we had a wonderful skeptic in our class. A good skeptic in a class raises a lot of questions and makes you think and, and makes you want to uh, use your knowledge to explain what's going on. Well, this skeptic said, I don't know about you people, but she says, I just cannot believe that Jesus Christ is in that piece of bread that we receive in communion. She says, I just, I just can't grasp that. And so the people were explaining it and trying to help her to understand. And I sat back silent because in a flash I realized I didn't understand it either. I didn't, I didn't believe it either. So that night I went home and, and went to bed and I prayed about it. And I prayed, Lord, I believe that you are in the Eucharist because it is something that's been taught to me all my life. And so the gift of faith helped me to believe this Lord, I also believe it because I believe in the stories of Eucharistic miracles. I believe that when the Eucharist bleeds, I believe those stories. But Lord, I don't believe. Please remove my unbelief. And I went to sleep. In the middle of the night, I woke up and I was in a box of light. And I thought, that's interesting. And I went back to sleep. 
in the morning I didn't even think of this got up got dressed fed my animals ate breakfast and then I was headed for the computer and as I walked across the living room I stopped with a flash I remembered it all but I realized I was a changed person I believe totally that Jesus Christ is present in the Blessed Sacrament in that piece of bread I believed it totally in my mind in my heart in my very marrow of my bones I didn't even listen to the explanations yesterday so that didn't sink into my mind this is an infused light of understanding that went into my soul helping me to believe no one no one can under take that belief away from me now no one but I believe totally shortly after that was Holy Thursday it was one of the few Holy Thursday events in which I was alive with what was going on in the Blessed Sacrament there and after the, the Mass uh, everybody left uh, well the, first of all the ladies came up and cleared off the altar of everything and then everybody left even even father just my one friend and I remained before the Blessed Sacrament and father in other years had placed the Blessed Sacrament in the middle of the altar but this year he had a little table and he had set the Blessed Sacrament on this table and it was right in front of the first row now the first row of uh, 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 pews in the in this church uh, this very little church in Fort Jones uh, didn't have kneelers you knelt on the very first row of, of the of the sanctuary the very first step of the sanctuary and so my friend and I went to the first pew to to kneel on this first row just right in front of the Blessed Sacrament there and we went to kneel and we couldn't we couldn't kneel a force held us up in the air and and I don't know how long we stayed there I know I didn't stay there very long because I felt this force was like I wasn't worthy to be that close to the Blessed Sacrament and so I got up and moved a couple of rows back and knelt but my sis my friend stayed there suspended with her knees above the ground and you, you physically it's you know you, your muscles don't hold you up that long and so it was a force another thing it, it, you know it never happened again but reinforcing the belief that Jesus really is in the power in that bread his power his life his whole being his body blood soul and divinity is in the Blessed Sacrament in that piece of bread this is infused light of understanding by the Holy Spirit the gift of wisdom the gift of understanding enables us to penetrate God's mysteries but the gift of wisdom takes us even further it lets us taste them and gives us a delight in the knowledge of them there are two ways of knowing a speculative 
intellectual way and an experienced way, experimental way, resulting from a kind of connaturality with the object of our knowledge. And this is not so clear, but is much deeper than the, the former way of understanding. And it, it, the spirit of wisdom helps you grasp the inner substance of things. Thus, for example, because of the affinity of thought and affection that binds a mother to her child, she knows its heart much better than any other person. Similar to this is the knowledge of divine subjects, which are, which we acquire by the means of the gift of wisdom. Between God and us, there's a certain connaturality, a certain similarity produced by the love that unites us to Him. And in some way, assimilates us to Him. St. Paul says, He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7. The gift of wisdom enables us to know God and the divine things precisely through this connaturality. And therefore it gives us a delightful experience of them through love, which is the source of this gift of wisdom. Love is the Holy Spirit. Love is Jesus Christ. Love is God the Father. And this experience of the Blessed Trinity seizes the soul in its very center, that is, in the will, forcibly drawing it to God. And at the same time, inundating the intellect with floods of light. The gift of wisdom acts like the rays of the sun, which gives heat and light at the same time. Its warmth quickens charity in the soul. Remember I've talked about the feeling of the, of the, uh, the Holy Spirit within you and it gives you warmth? And, 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 and more you feel this warmth, it gives you love. Love for the other person. And through the enkindling of love, the soul is enlightened concerning divine realities and it enables to judge of them because it knows intuitively their infinite goodness and their absolute superiority over all created things. It's such a wonderful gift to have. Oh, the depth of the riches of God. From Romans chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depths of the riches of God. This is the cry of the soul, inflamed and illuminated by the gift of wisdom. And you sing God's praises all day long. All the gifts of the Holy Spirit are, are closely connected with love, with charity. For they abound only in souls who possess charity. And they develop in the measure that charity increases. So that the more you feel this love, the more you have this love, the more it increases within a person who loves. However, 
the gift of wisdom has a very special relationship to the love of charity primarily because it is set in the activity of the means of charity. You become love to others. You become love to others. Remember, uh, Mother Teresa would say she sees Jesus in the face of the poor. You see Jesus in the people you serve. You are serving Jesus when you take care of them. So the more a soul loves God, the more capable it becomes of receiving the motions of this gift, the more you can love others. When you receive this gift, the more you can love your husband, your spouse. The more you can love your children. The more you can love your co-workers. In addition, the delightful knowledge of God derived from the gift of wisdom is a powerful means of increasing charity. How can we fail to love the Lord after having tasted His sweetness? In the measure that the gift of wisdom invades the soul, charity increases. And so does its unitive force by which the soul adheres more closely to God. It becomes more united with God, with this love, this gift of wisdom. Sometimes you're on the receiving end of this love. And for Americans, it's very hard because we're independent. We don't want help from anybody. And I'll never forget the Christmas. My dad, uh, he was hardly ever drove, and this was Christmas, and it was snowing out. Uh, church was uh, 11 miles away in Ripon, Wisconsin. And his neighbor offered, maybe he asked his neighbor, can, I, can you drive me to church? And they went Christmas Eve. So he drove over to Ripon, went to Mass Christmas Eve, and then they drove back. And on the way back, Dad learned that they were going to turn around and go back to Ripon for a Christmas Eve party. And he felt so bad for making them take this special trip. He wished that he had never asked him if he could ride with him for Christmas Eve. And I said, Dad, this was a gift that they gave you. You've been Jesus to people all your life. He was now in his 90s. Now it's your turn to let Jesus that other people be Jesus to you and gain the graces by serving others. So sometimes we have to be on the receiving end of the love of others. Sister and I did a retreat in uh, Trinidad with Babsy Bleasdale invited us. And she she uh, she took a liking to me and gave me a lot of pointers. And she said, when anybody offers you a gift, it helps you in your ministry by giving donations or gifts or whatever. Accept it, large or small. Maybe it's only a dollar, she said. But that gift enables them to be part of your ministry, enabling them to, you know, you're, 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 you've given yourself to the Lord. This is your ministry now. 
and you need the help of others. But some people cannot offer you more. Accept that gift because that's what they are giving out of their love and their way of wanting to help you. This gift of wisdom leads to more profound prayer. Because the soul is seized and drawn to God in just an irresistible way. You just, you just want to spend time talking to the Lord, just chatting, not necessarily saying the rote prayers, but just connecting with Him, just all day long telling Him you love Him. Because it, you, it, you feel united with Him. You feel that He's right there with you. And He is. But you know it. You feel it. You feel His presence. And you, you know for certain the teaching that God is always present to you. And, and, and He knows. You know this in the most intimate way. And the soul emerges from this prayer just inflamed with love. A love that conforms to the will of God and all that He has planned for you. Knowing that in the present moment, this is His will for you. Sometimes it's profound when you realize this. Like, uh, uh, after I joined Sister, Sister Frances appeared to many people. And one time she, she appeared to Delphine and she said, Tell Matthew, I'm so happy. Tell Matthew that I'm so happy with your new partner. For all eternity it was planned that she be your partner. And I've I've meditated on this you know, for all eternity. God knew my whole life before I joined Sister. He knew my aches and pains. He knew my life on the ranch. I had always dreamed of living on a ranch and having horses and, and two sons. And that's he fulfilled that dream as well as being a, still part of the plan of having me join sister. So the gift of wisdom helps a person just sees and considers everything in relationship to God. In this way, the gift of wisdom extends its influence into our very practical life and teaches us to judge all things in the light of God. In order to receive the actions of the gift of wisdom, the most sublime of all gifts, we should gently prepare our heart for the influx of love. And at the same time, apply ourselves to acquiring the gift of humility. Because Jesus has said, Thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, but has revealed them to the little ones. Matthew eleven twenty five. And John of the Cross said, And those alone acquire the wisdom of God, who are like ignorant children, and laying aside their knowledge, walk in his service of love. That's from his book, Ascent of Mount Carmel. The beatitude that goes along with this wisdom, this gift of wisdom, 
is blessed are the peacemakers. A soul that has tasted God under the gift of wisdom looks at the world with the eyes of God and therefore is able to judge all things by divine principles according to supernatural motives and not according to human reasoning. These are really, truly the wise judgments that we can never formulate without the help of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the central man, the man of senses and of natural reason, perceiveth not these things at all. because they are the gift of the Holy Spirit. To natural man, it is nothing but foolishness. He cannot understand. Could his, his spirituality examined? But the spiritual man, the man of faith guided by the Holy Spirit, judges all things. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 14 to 15 he judges all things in relation to the supreme cause God therefore he directs all his actions and others and orders everything in his life according to God from this order the only true order comes peace the fruit of the wise direction of the gift of wisdom Hence, the man who habitually lives under the influence of this gift is a peaceful person. A peaceful person par excellence. His heart is established in peace. There's no longer anything disordered in it. All his affections, all of his desires, all of his thoughts, all of his acts are completely ordered according to God being wholly submitted and conformed to his laws, to his will, to his good pleasure. One who possesses peace decimates peace. A peacemaker is one who makes peace, cultivates peace, and spreads it about him. This is why the gift of wisdom corresponds to the gift of peace, the beatitude of peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. Only one who lives under the influence of this gift can truly judge and regulate everything according to God, so that nothing, not even suffering, can disturb his interior peace. For he knows it he knows that even painful happenings are permitted and ordered by God for the good of his elect. To them that love God, all things work together for good. Romans 8, verse 28. The gift of wisdom leads us to peace. The interior peace of the soul, who having tasted God, gives itself to Him, gives itself to God without reserve, in complete surrender to His divine will. The serene peace of one who, seeing God in all things, accepts the hardships of life without being disturbed, adoring God's providence in it. Finally, it is a social peace of him who, considering all men in relation to God as, as his creatures and as his children, loves them all and wishes them all to live in peace with, with everyone. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are called children of God. All Christians are children of God by grace, but... There, here we are considering the special reward that we might call a superabundance 
of the grace of adoption, an experience by which the soul not only knows, but even feels and tastes that it is a child of God. The Spirit himself give us testimony to our spirit that we are the sons of God. Romans 8, 16. The soul itself feels called a child of God. Not by men, but by God. No audible voice speaks it, but the more it feels drawn to God and enjoys its intimate union, so much the more does it feel that He is its Father. And that in very truth, it is his child. And you feel a great warmth when you pray, Lord, wrap your arms around me. Abba, Father, I love you so much. And I need your love. I need your love so much. Our God is a God of peace, and therefore it is perfectly right that the peaceful man who possesses and diffuses peace should feel in a, in a very special way that he is God's child. If men generally do not feel themselves to be children of God, it is because they are so little disposed to peace, so ready for disputes, so ready for quarrels, so ready for war. They talk about peace, but they do not make peace. For they do not accept the guidance of the spirit of wisdom. In their ignorance, they prefer to be guided by themselves. And as a result, they are dominated by pride, self-interest, cupidity, or love of yourself. They live in disorder and they sow disorder all around them. Every grace, every gift comes to us from Jesus. And through them, our person and our life are sanctified. By means of sanctifying grace, he sanctifies our soul. Through the inverse, fused virtues, he sanctifies our faculties, our intellect and our mind and our will. And by actual grace, he sanctifies our activity, enabling us to act supernaturally. He's not content with setting us on the road to God, supernaturalized by grace and the virtues, but he wishes to substitute his divine way of acting for our human way. Therefore, he enriches us with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which makes us capable of being moved by God himself. All this is a gift of Jesus to us, the fruit of his passion. The Holy Spirit is also his gift, the gift par excellence, which he merited for us by his death on the cross. The gift which he and his Father are continually giving us, sending us from heaven to enlighten us and direct our souls. Considering the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the Beatitudes, which are their fruits, we arrive at a better understanding of the marvelous riches of God that he has bestowed upon us. Every Christian possesses these gifts from the day of their baptism. Hence, there is no terminity or reckless boldness in the desire that we attain them all. And we ask for their full maturity within us. 
some some people say you know I've heard who are you or you think yourself holy but you ask for it to become holy no this is this is not some boldness that we have this is what God wants of us we, he wants us to ask I want it all I want all the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that our whole our soul can be completely invaded by the action of the Holy Spirit furthermore by this desire we respond to the like desire of God for us who has given us these gifts that we may be moved and directed by him by his Holy Spirit for so whoever are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Romans 8, 14. Let us then desire, nourish this desire in our souls. It is not too much. It is not too rash. It is not too presumptuous. God wills it. This is the will of God, our sanctification, your sanctification. That's the will of God for us. But for our desires to be effective, we must apply ourselves with ever-increasing generosity to dispose us, to dispose our soul for the action of the Holy Spirit. We have to ask for it. Let us be persuaded that before we can experience God in his divine union, the divine paraclete must accomplish his work in us through purification. We must become purified. Generosity, detachment, humility, all united with fervent prayer to implore the action of the Holy Spirit within us. Generosity, detachment, humility, and fervent prayer implore the action of the Holy Spirit. The charity of God is poured forth into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5.5 5. And only from Him can we receive it. We need fortitude to conquer ourselves, to face difficulties, and keep ourselves serene and generous. This has all been taken by the, from the book, Divine Intimacy. Let me look here, the name of the author again. By Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene, OCD, a Carmelite. You can obtain this book through Tan Publishers. It's a wonderful book. It's daily readings for the, for the year to grow in the spiritual life, in the mystical life. And this should be a book in everybody's bookcase. If you haven't read it, it's a book that you should obtain and read at least once in your life because it presents so many things and this one section of the book on the gifts of the Holy Spirit that I've used Divine Intimacy by Father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene we thank you for watching us on the Holy Spirit the next session will be on personal experiences. We've gone from the hardest to understand St. Thomas of Aquinas. We went through the catechism, scripture, the, the, the symbols of the Holy Spirit. 
We went through Born of the Spirit book, written by Ron Ryan. And then we went through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, as told by, uh, in the book, Divine Intimacy. And now we're going to be giving uh, personal witness testimonies of, Jesus, of the Holy Spirit in our lives, how it changed our lives. And, and thank you for, for listening. Thank you for following this course. God bless you.